New Testament, in the text today, it comes from the book of 1 John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, and we love God and obey His commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world? The one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with water only, but with water and blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds so that we may hear your word and put your word into practice, now and always, amen. Before I start, just so most of you know, there is a big bumblebee in here, but it's a Christian bee because it's in the middle of worship, so I think we'll all be fine. Don't scream in panic, and I think, well, it may have a laugh, but it was flying around pretty good uh, for a while there. So, okay, here we go. Uh, once upon a time, there was a lady that had to do a lot of flying for her business, and flying made her nervous. So to counteract this feeling, she always traveled with her Bible. Reading scripture on the plane helped to calm her nerves, and it gave her some sense of peace. On one particular flight, she was sitting next to a man who chuckled at the sight of her Bible. And after about being in the air for about 20 minutes, he turned to her and he said, you don't really believe all that stuff in that book, do you? And the, radio, the lady replied, of course I do. This is the Bible. He said, well, what about that guy that was swallowed by a whale? She replied, oh, Jonah, yes, I believe that that story actually happened. The man asked, well, how do you suppose he survived all that time inside the whale? The lady said, well, I don't really know, but I guess when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. And sarcastically, the man said, and what happens when you get to heaven and you find out that Jonah didn't make it to heaven? And the lady said, then you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, as Christians, we make our belief in God a very intricate and complex thing. We have People to, we have people that believe in the Bible and we have people who don't. And we have people who accept scriptures as God's word and people who tear that work apart. We have staunch servants of God and we have lots of judgmental critics. We have those who try and live faith-filled lives and those who wouldn't know God if God knocked on their front door wearing a t-shirt that said, I am God. Sometimes it's hard to know who we are and where we stand when it comes to our relationship with God. There is so much that we are expected to know and to believe. We are supposed to follow the Ten Commandments. We are supposed to obey the golden rule, love our neighbors as ourselves. We are to forgive 70 times seven. We are to pull that plank out of our eye before we make judgments, and we are to love one another. We are to show mercy. We are to accept forgiveness. We are to display love and receive grace. And if all that wasn't hard enough, there are those big theological shun words that we are all supposed to know and follow. Resurrection, crucifixion, justification, sanctification, Incarnation, salvation, predestination, revelation, and all the other Asians that go along with it. Sometimes it feels as if it's very difficult to live up to the Christian life. We needlessly complicate something that really can be quite straightforward. 
Our scripture for today puts God, Jesus, Christianity, and right living in very plain and simple language. Listen to this scripture, some of it, not all of it, as translated by Eugene Peterson. Every person who believes that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah, is God begotten. If we love the one who conceives the child, we'll surely love the child that is conceived. That's from the message. We are to love God. And if we love God, then we are to love the Son of God. And that means that we are part of God's family. Okay. And, and as part of God's family, what do families do? Families love each other. And they help each other. And they forgive each other. They lend support to one another. Families protect and guide and nurture and show loyalty. Families bring out the best in each other and see each other at their weakest and most vulnerable points. That's what we do as a family of God. And John is keeping this Christianity very straightforward. He doesn't use big fancy words or theological constructs. The message is plain. As Christians, we are to love God, love one another as one big family. And the best way for us to love God is to obey God. In the book, Feasting on the Word, William Jennings gives his perspective on obeying God. He says, love issues in obedience. Obedience is such an endlessly rich biblical theme because it defines so much of the journey of faith and so much of the journey's struggles. Love and obedience to God can be the best and it can be the worst things about our faith journey because the good and the bad can be so closely related. We obey God when we live out God's commandments. We struggle when we have the best of intentions, but we still fail in following those commandments. We obey God when we love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We struggle when we think we know better and we stop putting God first in our lives. We obey God when we love our neighbors as ourselves. We struggle when our neighbors are not helped or even considered. We obey God when we seek out God's forgiveness and repent from our sinful ways. We struggle when we make no attempt to ask for forgiveness and we are not forgiving of others. We obey God when we pray and when we read scripture and include God in our lives. We struggle when God is an afterthought and our prayers happen only in times of distress. We obey God when God is the fixed center of our lives. We struggle when someone or something takes God's place and God gets pushed to the side. Now in the scripture, John goes on to say that God's commandments are not burdensome. Now this doesn't mean that loving God, others, and being obedient is an easy task. On the contrary, the Christian life is probably harder to live and filled with more challenges than those who claim to be non-Christian. But we always need to remember that Christianity is never a get-out-of-jail-free card. We are not spared the hardships of what life can bring. So then, what does John mean when he says following God's commandments are not burdensome? William Barclay breaks this down in two ways. First, he says, with the vision comes the power. With the need for it comes the strength. Meaning that God doesn't lay commandments at our feet and then leaves us to our own demise or devices. God is ever by our side, empowering us to accomplish those commandments. Second, Barclay says, our response to God must be one of love. That is so true. We will go the extra mile. We will make the extra effort if it is done for love. God's love turns any burden into no burden at all. Following Christ is not burdensome. It is an opportunity to show our love. And that's not complicated. And the amazing thing here is that when we follow God in this way, when we keep it very simple and basic, all those big shun words fall into place. Resurrection, crucifixion, justification, all of the words I read earlier, all of these words, these big words, these important theological terms, these foundational thoughts are all being lived out and worked through when we keep our faith simple and straightforward. And the best way 
We, when we are to love God, we love Christ. And we love one another, and we are part of God's family. And the best way for us to love God is to obey God. Concept is not hard. And as hard as it may be at times to do this, to be on this faith journey, when we obey God, God is ever at our side because following Jesus is an opportunity to show our love. We believe in the power of God that we can love and do things for God that seem impossible. Certainly impossible for us to try them without God. Now years ago, before all the modern technology, the, the, there used to be a job. When, this was at a time when, when we had motor vehicles and we had train vehicles and they were both living together in society, uh, working side by side. And there used to be people, before they built the technology, there used to be people called signalmen. And it was a signalman's job. He would stay a little booth by the train tracks, by the stops, and when, and when he saw a train coming, he would get his lantern, uh, and he would check to see if there was a car coming towards the tracks, and if there was, he would wave his lantern so that the car would see that there's something up ahead, and the signalman would stay there on the road until the train safely passed, and then the car was allowed to travel on its way. And on one particular night, when a man was doing this job, train was coming, he grabbed his lantern, he saw the headlights in the distance, so he stood on the road and he started to wave his lantern. The problem was, from his perspective, it didn't look like the car was making any effort to slow down. So he waved his lantern more vigorously to get the driver's attention and it didn't seem to be working. So he started jumping up and down and waving the lantern so that attention would be shot. And he stayed on the road for as long as he could so that the car would see him so it would stop because that train was coming. And he stood there to the last possible second and he had to jump out of the way of the car. And the car blew past him and just as you hope wouldn't happen, it smashed into that train. And the train took the car right down the tracks and no one in that car survived. So as you would imagine, an, an, an investigation followed. An investigation that resulted in a court case, that resulted in a trial. To see if this incident was an accident or was there something that the train company, the driver, the signalman did that was negligent on their part. So during the trial, the signalman was called up to the stand and the prosecutor started asking him a series of questions. He said, you know, on the night of the accident, were, were, you, were you sick? Were you <coughs> impaired in some way, not feeling well? Maybe you were intoxicated. Maybe there was something in your life something in your family life, something going on that made you so distracted that you couldn't do your job properly. And to all of these questions, the signalman answered no. And then the attorney went on with another set of questions. On the night of the accident, did you check all your equipment before you began work that night? Did you make sure that you were so focused that you remain calm, that you remain clear-headed during the incident? Did you follow all the protocols and instructions in your manual that instruct you how to do this job? And to all of these questions, the signalman, the signalman answered yes. And so it went. Question and answer, question and answer, back and forth, back and forth. The attorney trying to get at the truth the man trying to answer the questions as honestly and as straightforward as he could. And at the end of the trial, the judge determined that this was an accident, that everybody did what they were supposed to have done, and this was simply one of those tragic accidents that took place. And that night at dinner, the signalman was sitting with his wife at the dinner table, and she said, I'm sure glad this whole thing is over because I know you were very worried about the trial. I know you were very worried about the outcome. I know you were very worried about the possibility 
of going to jail and being found guilty. And the man looked at his wife and he said, I wasn't worried about the outcome. I wasn't worried about the trial. I wasn't worried about going to jail. And he smiled at her and he said, but I'll tell you what I was worried about. I'll tell you what scared me to death is that that attorney was going to ask me if I remembered to turn on the lantern. And when we live out our faith, it is so simple. We love God, we love God's Son, we live in God's family, and we follow God's commandments. When we don't do that, then we are like an unlit lantern, and we can do nothing to spread God's light in this world. But when we can do that, the light of Christ shines and shines brightly from our hearts for the whole world to see. Let us pray. Amen. Gracious God, be with us as we shine our lights for you. May this day and each day be an opportunity to do your work. In your name we pray. Amen.